Very good morning once more. Good morning. Today I've taken up a slightly different uh, topic from what we normally do. Because we keep hearing so much about it, I thought let us today you know, do a little review on this thing, which is gaining a lot of popularity and a lot of uh, significance. Let me start off by giving you an example. Somebody tells you, you know, my father and my parents never loved me. My father always used to favor my brother rather than uh, me. My parents always showed their affection based on how many marks I got. And after all that, I land up in a job where my boss is so horrible, he just doesn't understand. In fact, I feel he is looking for opportunities to put me down. He has got some enmity against me compared to the others who are much worse than me. He always scolds me in front of others. He doesn't scold anybody except me. Now, with all that going on, the other day, my spouse started yelling at me. And I said, this is too much. How long do you want me to suffer? I have always been the victim. I have always been put down. Everybody is against me. And now you are also going to do this? So what is happening? This person is has developed over a period of time a lot of what we call as false beliefs. If the person tries to generalize tries to take in the victim's role, tries to believe things which may or may not be true or may be true only partially. My father loved my brother more than me. It may or may not be true. That may be his manifestation. My parents, you know, loved me only based on the marks that I got. Yes, probably they gave a lot of emphasis on your marks because they wanted you to do well. So that was their way of trying to push that thing through. But is it true that they didn't love you if you didn't get good marks? From there it started off. And this person goes on and on and on thinking that this is wrong, that is wrong. And now the spouse says something and this person adds whatever is there as though the spouse is responsible for the parents for the boss, for all the other people who have been bad. So this is how our beliefs, you know, at times start piling up if we are not aware of them and if we don't take the precautions to ensure that they need to be rationalized. Okay. What do these false beliefs lead to? They lead to what we refer to as cognitive distortions. Cognition is the mind, the thinking uh, process. In fact, if you go all the way back to Greek mythology and the Greek philosophers, one of them had very correctly said, I think, therefore I am. I exist because I have the power of thinking. If I did not have the power of thinking, I would not be a living being. I would be a stone or a structure or whatever it is. So cognition is so important that it actually defines you as a living being. I think, therefore I am. But what do I think? Do I think correctly or do I get pushed off? Okay. Cognitive distortions generally are uh, you know, defined as unclear or inaccurate thoughts that lead to negative thinking and in turn painful emotions. So when I have these unclear thoughts, confused thoughts or inaccurate thoughts, I told you my father loves my brother more than me. That may or may not be accurate. So I have these incorrect thoughts in my mind and those lead to a lot of negative thinking. Nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, etc. And those thoughts lead to painful emotions. At the same uh, time, rationality gets disturbed. We become irrational. And when we become irrational, it affects our life in so many ways we don't even realize it. When we bring our thoughts back to the rationality, 
when we reduce these distortions in our thinking, in our cognition, and we come back towards the rationality, then what happens is that we proceed further in life. We go towards our goals and we do so many uh, things. Take a simple uh, you know, example. You have been called to attend some sort of interview for a deal, for a job, for a whatever uh, it is. And you attend that interview with a lot of preparation, a lot of hope. It doesn't work your way. You don't get what you wanted in that negotiation. Do you find yourself saying, giving, attributing meanings to the other person? I think he doesn't like me. That's why he didn't accept my proposal. I think he is biased only in favor of people of such and such caste. I think this person always favors women rather than men. And because I am a man, that is why he didn't agree to what my proposal was. These are the type of distortions which can actually destroy your life. To a greater or lesser extent, we all do it. So let us understand how this whole thing you know, happens and what it uh, uh, leads to. I'll give you an example of a few of these you know, false beliefs which some of us acquire as we grow up if we don't rationalize them, if we don't sit and review and put them back into order. These false beliefs can be very, very harmful. This is just a representative example. I've compiled a few and Anis has made it into a nice slide. Things like everyone dislikes me or other people ignore me. They give more importance to others rather than me. I can't impress anyone. I don't have that personality and that ability to impress people. That's why I get pulled off. There's no point in trusting anyone. People are not trustworthy. I've had A, B, C who has let down my trust. So I feel that nobody in the whole world whom I can trust. I will never succeed in whatever I do. Yeah, I keep trying. I have done so many things. I am still doing. But I am convinced that I will never succeed. One of the reasons could be I get cheated by trusted people. My own friends let me down. They don't cooperate with me. They don't help me. I will be never happy if I stay in my own country. How many youngsters I come across these days? What career? What do you want to do? I want to go to America. America is not a career. And America has nothing great to offer you which India does not have. But somehow they have, believe, they have developed this belief that my country does not give me. So I have to go out of my country. Then only I'll be happy or successful. Only people of my community are pure and pious. You've noticed a lot of people say that. It's good to, you know, love people of your community and have high regard. But that does not mean you have to put down others. No one listens to me, so I've stopped giving advice. Yes, there are times when people don't listen to you or they don't show that they are listening to you. But for that, why do you take up a strong attitude of saying I've stopped giving advice? My spouse will never change. There's no point trying. You've got your whole life ahead of you. And you have even neglected the ways in which your spouse has changed. But you are giving up. Every employee of government offices is corrupt. All government officials and all these people in government offices are corrupt. They are also human beings like you and me. No? They also have their values and this and that. Then no one will ever help me. See the generalization that we are uh, you know, going uh, uh, into. No one will ever help me. I am being thankless and ignoring so many people who have helped me in small, small ways. If you are nice to someone, they take advantage of you. So better not be nice to anybody. Better not be friendly. Better not help people. They'll take advantage of you. They're, they will always want to put you down. Mentally weak people can become mad on full moon nights. This is a very common thing that we keep hearing. Even in the 21st century, with mental health having taken so many advances, people still believe that full moons affect people's minds. 
the moon is happily sitting over there millions of miles away as if the moon has got nothing better to do than to get into your mind and change it on full moon nights that too okay top businessmen always cheat and crush the common man you can't trust rich people rich people are always horrible simple statement i can never be happy whatever happens i will not be happy think think of each of these statements how many of them you have felt at some point how many people around you keep making these statements flying in a plane is very dangerous and you can die statistics shows that your chances of dying in a road accident is not double or five times or 10 times it is 50 times more than the chances of your die, dying in a plane crash but yet people believe such things my relatives care for me only to assert my property i have these cousins and relatives who are being nice to me i think what they want to do is to take away my property i have made up my mind even if they have not shown any such indicators i can never take the right decisions for myself whatever i do i land up in trouble i always make a mess of uh, it you see this always coming in never coming in how many times we think always and we think never that's why there's a very nice proverb which says always remember never to use two words always and never okay i just cannot go on stage and speak to an audience you'll be amazed that among the phobias and fears that people have one of the most common ones is to go on a stage or give a public talk there are 90 percent 95 percent of us with training are capable of doing public speaking i'm getting continuous headaches i've had i think i have brain tumor haven't you heard people saying things like uh, that i think i've got cancer i think i have got this i think i have got that with no intention and i must tell you one of the greatest culprits in this is our internet the moment you have a lot of headaches you go on to the internet google headaches and before you know it google auntie is telling you that yes you may have a brain tumor you may you are likely to die all these type of stupid things so i just wanted to run you through some of the common ones you can make you know different uh, lists of your own but if you do that you will really be doing yourself a favor you'll be doing a favor to your near and dear and your loved ones if you understand the concept of these false beliefs how common they are how often we resort to these you know beliefs and once they get stuck in our mind they become part of our personality they dictate to us more than what we dictate to life we are governed by these type of uh, you know false beliefs more than the actual information or actual inputs that i am getting from so many ways i must re-emphasize you're all aware of it but i don't know how much you are doing in that direction please understand the impact of social media in creating false beliefs one is, of course, the childhood, as I gave you the first example. Somehow, due to the, my vulnerability in my childhood, I started developing some false beliefs. I actually started thinking this is wrong, that is wrong. This was bad to me. I'm a victim here. I have been suppressed there. I have been you know, put down there and all these things. But more than that today, it is the, you know, the uh, social media which is bringing in all these factors social media is actually in some cases at least taking control over your mind and if you are already allowing social media to you know develop these false beliefs that false information as we say anything and everything they keep giving you inputs and we start believing uh, it if that is happening already please be prepared that with the advent of artificial intelligence the electronics and the technology will completely take over your mind 
I am not sort of trying to scare you, but I'm just trying to help you to take these precautions that we need to vaccinate ourselves. How much we spend time talking about COVID all the time, isn't it? I think this is a greater pandemic than COVID. And many of us are not doing anything to vaccinate ourselves. Okay. Now, with all these false beliefs and this and that, what happens is that we move on to cognitive distortions, as I defined to you. So I think, but I start thinking in an irrational manner. Here, I'll give you some examples once more about what are the type of cognitive distortions that some people go through. One is what we refer to as filtering. That is, we ignore the good things and focus only on the bad. Whenever the weather is good, we just keep uh, uh, quiet. When the weather goes bad, we start complaining, seeing city has become so much hotter, see we are not getting rain, see we are getting too much rains. So this is called a process of filtering. We ignore the good things and we focus only on the bad things. There is another, you know, distortion that takes place in our mind, which they refer to as polarized thinking. Like we have South Pole and North Pole, we start thinking in black and white. We think either I should get everything 100% successfully or I am going to be a miserable failure. In real life, there is no po polarization. In real life, there are shades in between the black and white. Those of us who have lost that out and start thinking only in terms of black and white are re you know, resorting to a lot of cognitive distortion which can affect our life very badly. There's another one which uh, we call as overgeneralization. That is, every time the same will happen. We start believing that every time this will happen, just because it has happened one, two, three times. So we start actually believing that this will happen every time. That is what we call as overgeneralization. Believing that these three bad experiences have set a tone and it will always be like that. There's another very dangerous one. Jumping to conclusions. Impulsive people jump to conclusions before even going into depth and before even thinking if you have got used to these false beliefs and this and that, we start, you know, thinking in terms of, you know, jumping to conclusions. The other one is very interesting. Minimizing possibility that a solution can be found. We minimize the possibility. I know that there are solutions. I know that something can be uh, done. But I start believing that, no, that is not possible. Nothing will happen. If some well-intentioned person is coming and talking to you and saying, I know you're going through a bad time, but it can be set right. We refuse to even discuss it. Here's another one. Personalization. Believing that everything is focused on me. Every time people are bad only to me, the whole world or the whole universe is conspiring against me. We personalize it. My teacher is bad only to me. My boss scolds only to me. My spouse does these horrible things only to me. And because of that, we develop a wrong concept of what is fair, what is justice. And we develop this sense of persecution. As I told you earlier, that I am a victim. We start blaming. We start passing the buck. And we start refusing to take responsibility. I am responsible for everything that I do. Innumerable good thinkers have told us that 90% of what happens to us is based on how we respond to those 10% negative stimuli. But yet, we have this habit of blaming others. Similarly, another practice that some of us do is to develop this shoulds, that is, making rules for others. He should do that. 
she should do that. He should not do this. She should never behave that way. We start setting rules for others in this whole you know, process of how the thing goes. Then we move on to emotional reasoning. We try to put logic into uh, you know, our emotion. Emotion never respond to logic. If a person is angry, the person is angry. If the person is depressed, the person is depressed. If the person is thrilled and feeling very proud of himself, that's how it is. Then, finally, rewards or punishment from heaven. This is a very interesting thing. We start saying, God will punish you. God will set you right. God will do this. God will do that. And by saying that, there's nothing wrong in having a belief in God, obviously, and believing in uh, justice. But by passing the buck to God, you know what you are doing? You are absolving yourself of the responsibility. You are not taking the responsibility that, yes, I have to do. So. If I sincerely believe that some, you know, injustice has been done to me, then I should try to do something. Uh, no? I'm always reminded of that Arab proverb which my grandfather had told me in my childhood. Believe in God, but tie up your camel first. If your camel runs away because you have not tied him, it is not God who is responsible. It is you who is responsible. You have to tie up your camel to ensure that he doesn't walk away in the middle of the uh, night, isn't it? So primarily what happens is that when we have these cognitive distortions, they prevent us for, from taking responsibility for ourselves. We start passing the buck. We start taking irrational decisions. We start making a victim of ourselves. And we get into that vicious cycle by which our self-esteem goes down. Our thinking gets battered. And most important, our relationships go bad. We don't even realize how relationships are going bad because of our cognitive uh, uh, distortions. And this is something that we need to definitely look into. Now, I told you in the beginning why I took up this topic because it's become very common. You must be hearing a lot about this concept called CBT. The full form is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. There are innumerable therapies to heal the mind, right? Healing of the mind is called psychotherapy. Psych is the mind, therapy is healing. So you keep hearing of psychotherapies. So many of them, wonderful psychotherapies. One of them is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Why I'm bringing this up at this time is because of late, you know, as it happens, there are trends. If something gets popular, it continues to be popular. I remember long back, Every second person in the world of mental health used to talk only about TA, transactional analysis. In between, there was a spurt of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So like that, seasons come, seasons go, something becomes popular, something doesn't. But off late, anybody who is having any form of you know mental health issues and they go to a professional, one of the most common things that they recommend is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, meaning to say you change your cognition, you change your way of thinking, and your behavior will change. Your results will come. Your relationships will improve. So there are ways and means of changing the cognition. And that is what is done through CBT. We also practice CBT. In fact, we hold short workshops for our counselors, you know, who have done DCS and who have got the basics of understanding psychotherapies. We do these workshops on CBT and stuff like that. Or many a time we do it, we utilize it and we do it without labeling it, because I am not a person who believes in labels. I don't like to tell a person, you have got obsessive compulsive disorder, or you've got attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. 
if I feel the person is headed in that direction, so be it. He needs help and here I am. I'm going to use certain techniques. I'm going to use certain ways by which I'm going to help that person to overcome whatever is the need, isn't it? But that is what I want you to understand. That on the one side, don't get carried away by the you know season that comes in so that everybody talks the same language. At the same time, be aware of the utility of some of these methods which are quite effective in firstly helping you to realign your false beliefs and secondly to reduce these distortions in your thinking pattern that is the cognitive distortions these two are a lethal combination starting with false beliefs we move on to cognitive distortions and that as i mentioned earlier create so many complications for you in general. I will today only very quickly tell you the methods that are used in working through this, uh, you know, cognitive distortions. One is what is referred to as journaling. Put it down in black and white, write it down, if not on a paper or on the notepad of your phone or something. This is what I believe in. This is what I think is happening. This is what I am, you know, thinking at the cognitive uh, uh, level. When you read it later, you'll get a better and a more objective, uh, you know, picture uh, of it. Unraveling, you know, that is identifying and uh, you know, challenging the most harmful ones. Remove those which are most uh, uh, harmful. Restructure your mind, restructuring. That means I have to first deal with this, then I have to deal with that. This is where I'm getting affected. This is where I can neglect prioritizing, putting things in um, order. And then exposure and response prevention. When I'm exposed to something, this is how I respond because of my cognitive distortions. So if I can monitor the way I, I respond to various uh, exposures, I will know whether I am on the right track or not. And I will be able to review from time to time and thereby reduce my uh, cognitive uh, uh, distortions. Making a script which will last till the end, go through the whole process, you know, where the, uh, you, where the scripting takes you through that entire process. Have a goal and say, this is where I feel I'm getting affected. This is where I need to make a change. And I will keep following it up till I come to what we call as the end of the uh, uh, script. I also want to mention over here that along with the mental changes and the mental exercises that we need to do to remove these false beliefs and these cognitive distortions, mind and body are very closely connected to each other. The more you take care of your body, a simple thing, a technique which is quite often practiced or taught is what we call as progressive muscle relaxation. When the muscles of your body one by one are relaxed and not going into the techniques, you can ask any expert, they will uh, uh, tell you. And the other is this mindfulness, which comes out of, you know, simple things like deep breathing, pranayama, yoga, whatever it is. So when you get into your mind and start practicing what is known as mindfulness, that is being uh, aware of the present, and living in the present, identifying the present and knowing what you need to do, you will get wonders in that. Lastly, just as a sideway, I want Anis to show you a cute little cartoon. There are two men looking at these logs from two different directions. Look at it from the left, the person standing on the left and count. He's saying there are four. One, two, three, four, right? He's correct, no? Okay. Now go to the person on the right and look at the other end of those logs. And that man is saying that they are three. He is also right. Look at it from the right and you will see three. Look at it from the left and you will see four. Who is right and who is wrong. So let me show you through a quick little demonstration. Sonal and Anushri will take you through a little skit which will help you to understand how you know, these things happen and what can be done about it. I'll take a one minute break and I will be back.
so we'll just share one incident which had recently happened yeah in a role play form hey hi anu hey sodal how are you i'm good how are you, you? oh i'm too good nice. you know last week i had met you and uh, you remember that day i was so angry and frustrated Yeah, I was like, "What to do?" My mom was keeping on scolding me. Don't use phone. Don't use video game. I was so angry, and you, you were totally distorted. Yeah, and you were so shocked seeing me in that angry mood. True. I didn't know what to do. But you remember that you suggested me one thing. Yes. That I uh, know you should. I think start observing your mother when she's exactly. angry, mm-hmm. and that's what I did. Few days back, when my mom started scolding me again, I just kept quiet. And I just started listening to her without back answering to her, and then you know what I observed? What? I just observed that she's actually not angry on me. Mm-hmm. I used to think that my mom don't likes me at all, mm-hmm. but then I was wrong. She was actually throwing up her anger on me because she herself was stressed out with her own stuff. Mm-hmm. And thank God I didn't spoke out or utter out a word anything. If I would have done so. Then I must have surely hurt my mom, and later I would have also felt so bad about it. Thank you so much, Sonu, for telling me that suggestion and did. Hey, great, Anu, that you you know uh, listened to it and actually followed what was told to you. Don't you think this is something you can share with the young children who are going to come next week? Oh, Youngs and Blossoms are starting next yes, week. Yes. Oh my God! I was just waiting for that particular summer camp, Youngs and Blossoms. Well, it's such a night. beautiful insight. This happens to every other child. They get angry. They feel my mother doesn't love me. But then the child also thinks, "What is this? What is my mother thinking about me? She doesn't respect me." It's like very unhealthy environment that happens at home. It will be nice if you can share with this child. I would really love to share. And young the blossom starting there are a lot of activities, role plays, games that are going to start. I can't wait for it. I'm just eagerly waiting to start with it. Yeah, great, sure. great. So yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, audience. Also, yeah. Before we speak about Chintan, I will just like to speak about how we can use our vacations wisely. when we have we adults have vacations we try to do something which is completely different than our routine right totally different why because we are so stressed because we look at milestones we look at targets and we just work as if you know there is no other day but only work 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 for a result to see in whereas children keep studying they don't even know why they are studying they are studying because they are told to be studied that also is a kind of stress and in the vacation also we say keep studying so that you don't forget what you have studied so can we see how we bring that distortion in their mind right instead of that give them exposure of something completely different where they can also unwind themselves yet learn something which can be remarkable which can be enriching which can be a long term effect even when they grow big yeah so think about it which are those activities that you can indulge your children into and make their vacation a most memorable one yeah now can we have the chintan poster anis yeah so as you know earlier ali used to call this third thursday talks as third thursday talk now we call the same talk as chintan where we it's an interactive talk where a topic is taken and this 20th april the topic is can women be better than men question right we all are wondering can women be better than men some women must be thinking we are already better than men and some men must be thinking this can never happen or they may be thinking the other way also whatever that confusion is do not assume anything rather come to the chintan talk let's interact let's understand and go with something good in your mind and something to take forward to yeah so see you all on 20th april 10 to 11 at training house banjara
Yes, I'm back. And as I had announced uh, in the last couple of weeks, this uh, second session will last as long as you have questions and comments to make. So get in and st start off fast with whatever you have to say, and I will respond to it. And when the last one is over, even if it is not 12 o'clock, we will wind up the session. We start with Asha, who says, does competition bring about cognitive distortions that heads of organizations are unable to see the potential in other employees that an employee who could be an asset is lost because of wrong decision making. Yes, Sasha, it is definitely possible. But you know, it is not just the question of competition because there are people who face heavy competitions and they respond to it proactively. Yes, I know. I will evaluate the strengths of my competitors. I will balance it with the strengths of our product or our services. And I will get down to seeing how we can face the competition. But people who have cognitive distortions, you know, my competitors do un unethical things. My competitors cheat. People get carried away by my competitors. My employees are not reliable. They go by the competitors. I cannot trust this person. That is where the cognitive thinking even destroys whatever possibility there was to overcome the competition. Sri Devi says, when my son went for blood donation in his college, he came to know that his blood group is AB+. Whereas his blood group is recorded as A+, in his birth certificate. He went to Google and came to know that the change of blood group happens when we have cancer sort where he checked himself and got his blood checked in a clinic. He told to reassure himself and feel fine. But as a selfish mother, I still pray for my son's health. And I think it might be a human error for the birth certificate. I'm not a medical expert, Sri Devi, but I can definitely tell you that just this, you know, distortion of the blood group is no indicator that uh, this person has cancer or anything uh, like that. Within my limited knowledge, I can reassure you there is nothing absolutely to worry about. On the other hand, if your son is actually AB positive, you know that it's a very rare blood group. He can save lives of people by donating uh, blood. AB positive blood is needed much more than all the other blood groups. There could be people who are on the brink of death and whose lives can be saved by the blood that he donates periodically. So go ahead and enjoy. Okay. Praying also might be my self-defense, sublimation, or default cognitive distortion sort. I feel uh, uh, now. No, don't worry. Prayer cannot be a cognitive uh, distortion. Prayer is by the means by which you are connecting to the source or to the, you know, creator. And when you have a you know one-to-one -one dialogue or interaction with your creator, you always feel nice uh, uh, about it. You know, when it becomes a distortion, when you start saying, "God, I must get minimum ninety percent." If I get 90%, I will go to Tirupati and put so much money in the hundi. Those are distortions, right? Diksha says, also blaming stars, astrology. Yes, that's a very, very interesting uh, thing. I told you about the moon, you know, how people think on full moon nights, people go mad and stuff like that. The same way people think that, you know, the stars and the constellations and this and that, they govern our lives. I'm sure those stars and constellations have better things to do than to pick this person in, in uh, on the earth, which is a tiny planet, and in that into India, and in that into Bangalore, and in that into so-and-so locality, and to this person, and let me change this person's life. No, that is definitely a distortion. Akila says, there are many instances where I have felt isolated, not being loved, not the priority being used for their advantage. It was very difficult for me to overcome those feelings. But I'm really happy, Akila, that you've done it. I know that you are a fighter. I know that you're a person who will not allow yourself to get, you know, deluged by such things. When you did have those distortions, if you did manage to overcome and get over it, yes, you may have definitely gone through a bad time. There would have been people who ignored you or who did not love you when you expected their uh, love. But that's all part of life. So when you do not get love from one person, you get from another uh, person. Some people are bad to you. Some people are good to you. Life is always like that, isn't it? Shobha says, I feel that my husband's relatives do things to make some conflicts between us. Quite possible, Shobha. But the question is, 
that how are you and your husband taking it? If you pass the buck, as I was telling you in the first half, if we develop this habit of passing the buck, it is my in-laws, it is my husband's relatives who are doing this. What are you doing? You are surrendering control over your relationship with your husband. Whatever may be the source, it could be in-laws, it could be financial problems, it could be something else, doesn't matter. The fact is that you have a life partner with whom you have to live the rest of your life. And on a continuous basis, you have to keep building a healthy and loving relationship with that person. So forget what the cause was, work in solving it, right? Navina says, thank you so much, Sonal and Nanu. So well role played, message was loud and clear. Change your perspective of looking at things and your response will change. That's one of the reasons why when they offered, I said, yes. You know, sometimes they say that seeing is believing. When I say something in words, it doesn't have the same impact when you see a little bit of a role play or anything. We always try and put in these things which have a far greater impact. Hmm. Husna says, is generalization the same as overgeneralization? No, Husna. Generalization, we do. You have been going through this in our DCS classes also. That generalization sometimes does happen and there's nothing wrong with it. That certain such locality, people are not very good. So I will avoid going by that route. I will go for something else. There may be good people also in that locality. But generalizing to say that there are some bad people who may create problems. So let me avoid it. But overgeneralization is when you say every slum is full of criminals and antisocial elements. That is what is overgeneralization. Roshan says, after doing DCS, I did CBT. Just listening to eight sessions of CBT and reading a book, Feeling Good by David Burns, I am able to help school teachers understand this subject and I'm getting more experience. Wonderful, Roshan. That's how it should be. You know, you build up your skills at a practical level. Not everybody can do some MPhils and PhDs and research and all these academic things, but it is not needed. A lot of things directly connected to human life can be done by practical exposure. And that's what Roshan showed you. All of us are capable of doing that. Pallavi says, please refer books on cognitive distortions. OK, I will do that later. Or if you can just send me an email, I'll send you some of these uh, names of good uh, uh, books. Feeling Good uh, by David Burns, uh, what uh, Roshan told you, right, is one of the really good books on CBT. Mm. Raji says, thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for choosing this topic. So relevant. As a cancer survivor, I have been told so many things, people searching Google and telling me what to do. Luckily, my oncologist was very cool and told me, why are we here if Google is going to tell you everything? But it is disturbing sometimes. Yes, Raji, you have become aware that it is disturbing. And there is this, you know, when you have something as serious as an ailment or cancer or whatever it is, the mind is restless. The mind wants to keep on exploring, finding out, looking at different options. And that is the reason why I cautioned you just before the break that we should not surrender ourselves to technology and Google and all that. It can be very useful for getting some tips and information, but something as serious as an ailment. I have got a disease, I've got cancer, I've got whatever I've got. I think there are wonderful experts, professionals, doctors who are 100 times more competent to diagnose us, analyze us, take, you know, take us through the treatment, but we will be missing it out if we unnecessarily rely on all these, uh, you know, Google and all these things, right? Diksha says, past experiences also bring in cognitive distortion and hereditary also makes one belief on ailments. Example, parents diabetes, so children will get diabetes. Like I mentioned about generalization and overgeneralization, yes. Diabetes does go through with the genes. So if your parents, grandparents were diabetic, you have to take more precaution than if you come from a lineage where there was no diabetes, right? But it just means that you are more prone to it. You have to take more precaution. There's no guarantee. Overgeneralization is where you take it for granted that I'm also going to get diabetic and I'm going to die and something like that. That does not happen. Also, the fact that treatment available during the time of your elders and treatment available now is completely different. Diksha is asking, can we change this thought process? Yes, definitely. That's why 
I told you in the first half those techniques that we use uh, by bringing about the change in both in false beliefs and in cognitive distortions, which includes journaling, unraveling, cognitive restructuring, exposure and response prevention, scripting till the end, and also taking care of your body in certain ways. Nikhat says, social, cultural, and religious conditioning create a lot of distorted thinking that can be very difficult to undo and come with a lot of guilt when one starts working on it. Absolutely right, Nikhat. As a medical professional, you must have been seeing this left, right, and center when you deal with patients and with your counselees also, that it plays a very important role. But as long as we have the desire or the inclination to bring about the change, it is not impossible. Anybody can bring about that change. Okay, Naveen Kumar Saab, Namit Kumar Saab, Mr. Saraf, all the way from Maharashtra. He is a very regular with us, and I really appreciate his participation in these sessions. Cognitive distortions are directly linked to the heredity by most of masses, but actually, it's a behavioral pattern which changes as circumstances change. Yes. Cognitive distortions are not genetic, unlike diabetes or anything like that. And that is the reason why we should put in more effort, because we can change it. You can't change your diabetes. You have to live with uh, diabetes if you acquire it. But you can change cognitive distortions, right? Hmm. Vinita says, yes, Ali, after doing DCS, new journey has started. But after doing CBT, it's like I have stepped into an ocean. So much learning happens every day in my counseling. It helps me, of course, firstly, to understand the behavior patterns and still reading the book to understand better. Keep up with it, Vinita. It's a wonderful, long journey, but a very enjoyable journey. Ha, Husna says, religious and social pressure many times leads to us blaming ourselves and thinking irrationally what can be done. We start off with identifying the false beliefs that were put into us. While every religion teaches all the good things, but the middlemen try to scare you by saying all sorts of things which may or may not be true from the spiritual angle. And the best weapon that they have of holding them is by threatening you that if you don't do this, you will burn in hell and you will be damned and all that. Let us first make that effort as we grow up into adults to rationalize and remove those false beliefs. Then it becomes easier to change your cognitive distortions and start leading a better quality of life. Reena calling in all the way from Sikandabad says, I think if your thoughts are clear and positive, every action will be perfect. Yes, that is what we should aim for. But you know that perfection is not that easy, isn't it? Vinita says, I can say distortions start very early in life, which keeps increasing, if not addressed. Very true, Vinita. This is what I'm trying to tell you, that the more you neglect it, it's like, you know, if I get cancer, today cancer is 90%, 99% curable. But if I ignore it and I land up in the fourth stage of cancer and then go to a doctor, they can't help me. No? Same thing applies over here. Earlier you deal with it, the better it is. Help the younger generation with it also. Help children, the younger people also by correcting their false beliefs and correcting their cognitive distortions. Navina says, we need to practice mindfulness and take charge of our own life. Yes, I mentioned that. Once we take back the remote control of our life, we would be able to respond and sail through wonderfully in life. Also, energy flows where thought goes. So whatever we energize, that would manifest. Example, if we blame a person for something, we are giving that power to that person and attracting more such situations as we are energizing that blame and situation. Very well put, Navina. You have really identified it well. And this is something which all of us need to you know, take cognizance of and be aware of. Roshan says, after reading an article on CBT in Reader's Digest, my daughter feels it is good for mentally ill to change their behavioral patterns by following the exercises written in the book. 
I'm happy to know that on her own, she has come to help us. That is what we need to do with the youngsters. Create that desire and the motivation in them to explore, to find out and to look for answers. Not keep telling them that this is good for you, this is bad for you, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. If we can have that magnanimity and that broad-mindedness, believe me, the youngsters will definitely move on to a much better quality of life. That was the last one. Okay. So with that, I will again, you know, remind uh, you very quickly that we all grow up with false beliefs. Some of them, unfortunately, connected to some religious uh, so-called gurus who try to, you know, threaten you and try to scare you or something like that. Some of them are to do with the culture that we are brought up in. Culture keeps changing. Lifestyles keep changing. If my grandfather went to school in a bullock cart, I am not going to send my child in a bullock cart, isn't it? So certain things which have nothing to do with the basic ethics and principles we need to change. So we need to put in all these efforts to make sure that, you know, we list out, we identify and we consciously remove as many false beliefs that we have acquired right from childhood. With that, we need to move on to the cognitive distortions where my thinking has become distorted, where I have actually started thinking in a manner which is becoming painful and which is causing me painful emotions and which is preventing me from moving on to a better quality of life. If we can do all that, we can do wonders. We can you know, do what Navina has put up just now. Wonderful. I think we can identify our false beliefs and distortions by seeing its response in our body. That's what I mentioned to you. Navina has put it very nicely. The mind-body connection. If we feel uncomfortable with a particular belief, then we need to work upon it and finally let go. Mind and body are so closely. Sometimes the body tells you what your mind is not uh, uh, telling you. Yes, we have one more from Sheila. Self-awareness leads to processing our thoughts in an appropriate manner. Also, being assertive is very important. Yes, I agree with you, but I'm not dealing today with assertiveness because assertiveness comes only after we have been able to remove the false beliefs or minimize them and change our distortions of uh, e-cognitions, right? Okay, so that was it. We've had a wonderful uh, time and I won't keep you people held more than that we will meet you again next week with a very interesting and a little bit of an unusual topic which i thought i will you know this thing called self-talk do you talk to yourself many of us do many many of us do but we feel embarrassed to tell it yet if you go back into your childhood you used to happily keep talking to yourself and Adults would come around and say, what are you doing? Whom are you talking to? No, I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to my imaginary friend. I'm talking to God. I'm talking to whatever it is. So what's the difference between childhood and adulthood? And what do we need to do as adults about this concept of talking to oneself? Self uh, talk. We will do this uh, thing next uh, uh, Saturday, which is on the 22nd of April. So see you then. Bye bye.